Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. Before we get started, just a quick thank you for getting Extreme Genes to where it is today. We're on radio stations all over America, and our podcast is growing exponentially. I'm often asked, what can I do to support Extreme Genes? Well, that's easy. Become a part of our Extreme Genes Facebook community and like our page. Share the podcast with your friends. Follow us on Twitter. And most importantly, support our sponsors through links on our website. They're the best in the business. Thanks again. Now let's get on to this week's podcast. It's been this way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. Uh Uh-oh. You have found us, Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Great guests this week. Excited to have Mary Tedesco on the show. She is one of the hosts of Genealogy Roadshow, and the new season has begun. And we're going to get caught up on what cities they're visiting this year, maybe get a little hint of uh, some of the stories that they're going to share with us through the course of the season. Good stuff coming up in about nine minutes. And then later on in the show, we're going to have Paul Woodbury back. You may recall he's a DNA expert. And just a week or so ago, I had a little breakthrough after, oh, only 30 some odd years. And as a result of that breakthrough, I added the names of some ancestors to my tree and wound up with a DNA match to the ancestors that I had connected to. Now, the question is, how significant is a DNA match when you get back to, say, a sixth great grandparent level? Does it really make a difference in solidifying your research? We're going to find out about that from Paul later on in the show. But right now, it's time to head out to Boston, Massachusetts, and my good friend David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. David, how are you? I am doing great. It's a nice sunny day here in Beantown, and say a spring has definitely finally sprung. There's a lot of news in the world that, you know, kind of want to change the channel, and it's kind of sad and depressing. But I must say that the most heart-wrenching story in the longest time was a historical twist. I don't know if you heard about Sid Schaffner. He's 94 and who is part of the American army that went in and liberated over 30,000 Holocaust prisoners from Dachau concentration camp in southern Germany in 1945. Yes. yes. Well, this, this story is amazing. The video is online where he meets with a 90-year-old gentleman by the name of Marcel Levy. Marcel was only 17 at the time. And he embraces this American vet and tells him that he's basically responsible for him being alive, his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. I'll tell you the old saying, bring a tear to a glass eye. This one is definitely worth the watch. And, yes, I uh, agree. Being a child of a World War II veteran, I know the emotion attachment we have with this generation that we're losing more and more every day. But this is just a really great story. And I want to tell you, the next time that you go out to get your hair cut, Save a few strands of it, because it might be worth some money someday. What? Yeah, well, I don't know if you heard Thomas Jefferson, when he <laughs> passed away, 14 <laughs> strands of the former president's hair were saved by the doctor. And these were just sold off at auction for $7,000, which comes down to about 500 bucks per strand. 500 bucks a strand. You know, it's a shame, too, because unless they pulled it out through the roots, there's no DNA to be had from that hair. As I understand it, because he was dead, it probably wouldn't have hurt very much. No, exactly. (laughs) Getting back to veterans again, I couldn't let this go by without wishing a happy 110th birthday to America's oldest veteran, Richard Overton, who actually attributes his longevity to his chain smoking cigars. A splash of whiskey (laughs) in his morning coffee and a steady diet of catfish Butter pecan ice cream. I'll oh. tell you, I would say that I could live off of butter pecan ice cream. Catfish isn't bad. Don't smoke cigars. and not much of a drinker. <laughs> but I'll tell you, something's working for him. This veteran was with the 1887th Engineer Aviation Battalion in World War II. This all-black military unit started up in 1942, and he was stationed as a corporal in Hawaii, Guam, and Iwo Jima, and he was a skilled sharpshooter. So... Happy birthday, Mr. Overton. Many more. Wow. 
Well, you know, digging into history is one of my loves. I love genealogy and I love archaeology, and I think, you know, we dig deep enough, we'll find our ancestors one way or the other. It ties and, in. Well, it really does. And while they were building a train station extension over in Italy, they found an old Roman barracks. Wow. Right near the Colosseum, and it housed Hadrian's Praetorian Guard. And it's over a 100-meter hallway with over 39 rooms, and many of them with detailed Roman mosaic floors. And that's amazing to think that it's just been there all that time. That is absolutely incredible. Well, you know, speaking of things that have been there all that time, I was going through some of my late father's belongings, and I happened to cross a school photograph. And Dad, unfortunately, wasn't archivally minded, if you will. The edges <laughs> of it have silver masking tape to hold it Ooh. together. And this group picture, it's in great shape, except for the picture of good old George Lambert, who has a circle and pencil around his head, because he wanted to mark where he was probably when he was a child. I love school pictures. It's the only one I have. My dad, in fact, is the only one of two pictures I have of him as a child. You must have some of your mom and dad that you've come across. Oh, well, absolutely. And, and it's interesting, because a few weeks ago, you brought up reaching out to schools to see if they had old yearbooks. Correct. And I did this, and I actually called my dad's elementary school, which is still an elementary school in Bogota, New Jersey. It was actually uh, built in 1909, I think. And so I called to ask how old their pictures might be that they had or yearbooks, and they said, oh, they didn't have anything like that. I said, well, you know, I've got pictures of my dad's classes from Bogota from the early to mid-20s, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. The third grade picture is actually marked with the names of all the classmates. She said, oh, could you scan those and send them to us? <laughs> and so we did. And I just heard back from them that they're setting it up as a display at the school. So hopefully some of the descendants of some of these kids will get to see their parents in these photographs from way back 90 some odd years ago. That's really great. I mean, it just kind of leads to the tech tip. If you have school photographs from when you were a kid identify the people in the picture because you never know. You could be giving a genealogical clue to somebody down the road. I mean, many of the ones with me back in the 70s and the 80s, I know who they are. Will my kids know? No. That's right. Well, in any HGS, we always have a free guest user database, and this week is no exception. So on AmericanAncestors.org, sign up for a free guest user subscription, and you can get Caribbean birth and baptisms from 1590 to 1928, marriages from 1591 to 1905, and deaths and burials from 1790 to 1906. I'd say I'd like to go there and actually do the research myself, but this is a nice way to actually <laughs> visit the Caribbean from home. <laughs> All right, David, thanks so much. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care, my friend. All right, and later on the show, we're talking about DNA, the significance of DNA matches. How much do they matter when you get far back? And coming up next, we talk to Mary Tedesco from Genealogy Roadshow on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, in three minutes. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. You know, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from MyHeritage, FamilySearch, and soon Ancestry and Find My Past. You can use it to create beautiful charts, reports, and books. And have you ever thought about making your own family history website? Roots Magic can make that happen too. And of course, there are free videos, guides, and technical support to help you along. Isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And I'm very excited. It's the first time I've gotten Mary Tedesco to come on the show. And she is, of course, one of the hosts of Genealogy Roadshow. And the new season is underway. It's the third season. It's exciting. This is a new opportunity for you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here and on my second season of this wonderful show, Genealogy Roadshow. Well, for those who aren't familiar with it, Mary, fill people in on what you do and how it works, because it's a great program. Great. So I'm one of the three hosts of Genealogy Roadshow, along with, of course, Kenyatta Berry and Joshua Taylor, which I'm sure that everybody knows. Uh, Well, Genealogy Roadshow Fish is the acclaimed PBS TV series that features participants from around the country with unique family claims and histories. So we also get to have a lot of fun researching these along with our research team and collaboration with our producers. It's just a really great time. We have a great season in store for you. I know many of your viewers probably saw the episode last Tuesday. We have another great one for you this week. Right. Now, you were in Albuquerque last week, and you're off to, what is it, Miami this week? Sunny Miami. Tough work. I, You know, I worked in Miami at one time in my life, and uh, it, it is a lovely place. It was a fantastic place, rich with culture. We have some great stories for you this, this week, Fish. One of my stories, a lady came to us, and she wanted to know whether she was related to Pocahontas, just to give you an example. Ah, and was it a DNA so, thing, or, or how did this work? Well, Fish, I can't tell you how <sighs> we did it yet. <laughs> You're holding but, back on me. You're holding back I, on me. Come on. Give me something. Throw me a bone, just, Mary. Just a little bit. Well, let's just say that other folks that may have similar claims to Pocahontas or another historical figure may be able to benefit from this in terms of research technique and other things. And is this Florida woman related to Pocahontas? Well, we got to tune in on Tuesday. That sounds like an interesting episode. You know, that's the thing that's so fun about genealogy is it doesn't matter if it's your ancestor or not, because you can relate, A, to the stories, and then you can learn from the research techniques to apply to your own efforts. Exactly. As a host on the show, Genealogy Roadshow, I learn a lot about new documents myself, because as genealogists, we're always learning. And we hope, of course, that the folks at home can also benefit from seeing new document types or new research techniques or different ethnic groups. It really rounds us out and makes us all better genealogists, which is something that I really love about the show. Yeah, absolutely. And we feel that here, too. A lot of people benefit from the stories of other people's ancestors on Extreme Genes, and it's a lot of fun. So do you actually ever get involved with DNA testing on Genealogy Roadshow? Yes, Fish. So some of our stories this season and in past seasons do incorporate DNA into the stories and sometimes use it as a technique to solve the family mystery at hand. I'm really looking forward to seeing this show. What other cities are you in this year? 
in this season, we're in Albuquerque, of course, as you saw, Miami this coming week, Houston, Boston, Providence, Los Angeles, and we have an episode fish with some of our favorite stories from the past couple of seasons. That sounds great. You're going to be all over the place. Coast to coast fish, just like we uh, like it. Let's talk about how you got in the show, Mary. This is an unusual thing. I mean, you're a genealogist, as are Kenyatta and Josh. What brought this whole thing together, and how did you become a part of it? It's a great story, actually. So the first season, of course, as folks know, there were two hosts, uh, Josh Taylor and Kenyatta Berry. So for the third season, they were looking for a third host to be part of the show. And I'm very honored and flattered, of course, to say that Josh and Kenyatta recommended my name to interview to be a part of the show. So basically, I auditioned for producers and PBS executives, and I was invited to join the show as one of the three hosts. And not a day goes by that I I don't realize and understand what a wonderful decision that was. And I've never looked back. It's been a a great experience and and a pleasure, to be honest. Boy, what a great opportunity for you. That's right. Now, you're an Italian specialist in your research. Tell us a little about that. That's correct. So, Fish, I run a research firm uh, called Origins Italy. Now, we specialize in Italian and Italian-American genealogical research. So we deal with cases like dual citizenship, like folks needing documents or assistance getting dual citizenship. And also, we really include um, in-depth Italian-American and Italian research projects. And what I mean by in-depth, Fish, is that we go on site to Italy and we get to the bottom of the story. We not only concern ourselves with names and dates, but we dig into other records like notary records, military records, et cetera, to really paint a full picture of your ancestors. So it's a pretty unique approach, but we try to go so far beyond names and dates to really tell the whole story something that I'm so excited about. You know, that's really true. If you don't get the stories, then you really can't know the ancestor and you you know, you can't love them. That's the bottom line, exactly. right? Exactly. There's no relationship exactly. to be had with just a name and a date. You have to dig. How long have you been doing this? So I first got exposed to genealogy just about 10 years ago when a, a colleague loaned me a login uh, to a big name genealogy site. Now, of course, I've since gotten my own login. Oh, that's good. After that, <laughs> <laughs> I, wanna, I need to preface the story by that. And then I was exposed to these early records in my research, like passenger lists for my grandparents. It really inspired me, Fish, to want to know more, to explore more. And at the time, 10 years ago, there weren't a lot of resources for Italian genealogy. So I was self-taught, and I went out there. I went to Italy to dig up records on my ancestors, which is a a great way to learn. Isn't that funny how we'll go about this work, you know, which so involves helping other people learn how to find their roots and dig up these stories. And then when we want to take a break, we research our own doing exactly the same thing as a respite. Exactly. Uh, Those of us whose passion is also their profession have got to keep ourselves in check because it's really (laughs) easy to just get carried away. And I know you and I were talking about that on the phone recently. But when we get fixated on an ancestor, we cannot stop. You know, us genealogists, we genealogists are up until two or three in the morning trying to track down an ancestor. Pretty normal stuff, I would say, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. My wife was out of town visiting grandkids in Nebraska, and we were having rain all through a weekend. So I was just, it was great. The cat was away. Right, right. And the mice, they dance, to use the Italian expression. (laughs) Yeah, it was a great time. All right, so let's talk about some of the things you found in Italy and what people could actually expect to find if they went over there and attempted to do some of the things you're doing. So the church and the city hall are great places to delve into your Italian genealogical research first. Now, at the city hall, you can find birth, marriage, and death records, and also some demographics records. And you can write to the city hall from home, from Italy. You can start tonight from your pajamas, which is pretty exciting. Nice. Now, by the way, how far back do those birth, death, and marriages typically go? So it really depends, Fish, on where your family is from in Italy. So, for example, in Calabria, which is in southern Italy, where my grandfather is from, civil records start in the early, early part of the 1800s. Whereas if you're up in Rome, for example, Italian civil registration would start in 1871 when that area became part of Italy. So you have to look to history first, Fish, in order to determine where those records begin. So before civil registration, there's also church records, which could take your family back into the 17, 16, or even 1500s. 
Wow. And that's typical. That is pretty typical. Now, of course, there are records that are missing, that were destroyed either by natural disaster or war. But until you have that information that it's missing, you can assume it's there and then, of course, confirm with an email or a phone call to that local repository. And I'm sure they'll be able to clear that up for you. Well, and of course, anytime you take a genealogical trip, you got to do your homework beforehand because your real currency on a trip is time. And you want to spend as much of it at home first, getting ready and figuring out where you're going to go and what you're really looking for and trying to accomplish some of that before you get there. You talked about a lot of the stories that come out of the records. What other records might yield some great fruit? So some other records in Italy to be aware of are notary records, which could usually be found at the Archivi di Stato system. Uh, Notary records could have things like marriage contracts between a couple or land transactions, things to help you paint a picture of the socioeconomic status of your family. You can also find military records, which are great. Now, fish on military records, Italian military records, you can find potentially a physical description of your ancestor, including height, hair color, nose, et cetera. It's pretty fascinating thing. Okay, Mary, so you know that anytime somebody comes on the show, they got to have one killer story for us. So what's yours? So growing up, my beloved grandmother often spoke about her father, Mario, and he was from Trentino in Alto Adige in northern Italy. So my grandmother mentioned many, many times that her father was very handsome, very tall, over six feet. Photographs seem to confirm this fish. She also said that he served in World War I for the Austro-Hungarian Army. Now, remember, Northern Italy, this part of Northern Italy was part of Austria at the time. So I said, I'm a genealogist. I need to go and prove this. I need to see how tall, (laughs) you know, Nonno Mario actually was. So I tracked down my great-grandfather's military records from Innsbruck, Austria, and discovered that he was, how tall, how tall, just five, five fish. Five, five? (laughs) Well, no wonder he survived. Nobody's going to hit that little guy. Exactly, exactly. So I brought this information home. I reported it to my family members. And my grandmother, in her classic Italian accent, was like, oh, really? He seemed a lot taller to me. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I I still have an aunt fish that doesn't believe this. You know, and I've shown her the original record. She says, well, it might be wrong, you know. Such right. Is the power of family lore. <laughs> yes, such is the power of family lore. Yeah, that can't be right, you know, because my aunt told exactly. me. Oh, my goodness. Well, Mary Tedesco, it's been a delight having you on, and I'm excited about the new season of Genealogy Roadshow. It's on PBS Tuesday night, 8, 7 Central, right? Correct. And uh, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with this time. Thank you so much, Fish. It's been a sincere pleasure to be on. And coming up next, it's a personal story about a breakthrough on one of my lines and a DNA match that may confirm it. But how reliable is that match? We'll talk to DNA expert Paul Woodbury next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the GrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file 
style and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. In the course of your research, you have had a DNA match. How significant is that really? Hi, it's Fisher, the Radio Root Sleuth on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. And I just had a breakthrough a couple of weeks ago. My wife was out of town. I stayed up late uh, just researching in my underwear till the middle of the night on a sixth great grandparent, somebody had had a, a long struggle with. She had married her husband in Vermont in 1765. And the question was, where did she come from? Whose family did she belong to? She died at age 77 in 1816, late 1816, pretty much placing her directly into 1739 as a birth date. Well, there was only one person named Olive Hill born in 1739 in that area, and she was born to Asa Hill and his wife, Sarah, in Sherborne, Massachusetts, way to the east, the eastern side of Massachusetts, 161 miles away from Pownall, Vermont, where my Olive Hill married her husband, Josiah Noble. So I had a real difficult time saying, well, this must be the same person, because how do you get them in the same neighborhood, at least, to get married? Well, a little traditional research yielded that uh, Asa started moving west. He fought in the French and Indian War. He was wounded. He escaped from a fort. I mean, all kinds of great military stories going on there. And as a result, he was awarded a land grant for 200 acres in what they now call the Berkshires, Washington, Massachusetts. And that actually took him and placed him and his family halfway between Olive Hill's husband, where he was from in Southwick, Massachusetts, and Pownall, Vermont. She was now just 30 miles away. And so it seemed to me pretty obvious when you look at the population charts from back around 1739 when she was born there were only 900,000 people in the entire country at that time, which is roughly the population of Delaware today. So I put this father and mother combination onto the chart as parents of Olive Hill and some grandparents and the like, just to see what would happen with DNA matches. And wouldn't you know it, a few days later, in came a DNA match for a seventh cousin under Asa Hill, the father, Asa and Sarah. And so the question came up, well, how significant is this in proving that this is the correct relationship? So that's why I wanted to get my good friend Paul Woodbury on. He's a DNA analyst for LegacyTree.com. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Scott. I was going through all the math here over the weekend, spent a lot of time mapping out how this works. And I guess it's kind of interesting when it comes to DNA matches. When we start uh, out the first four or five generations, there aren't that many couples. For instance, uh, my second grades, there we all have eight second grade grandparent couples, right? Exactly. And, and I placed mine the average time of birth somewhere around 1815. So roughly I'm thinking, okay, nine million people in the country at that time. But some of my couples may not have been born within the country, right? And, of exactly, course, of yeah. the 9 million people in America in 1815, only some of them lived in the area that my people were from. So, the bottom line, though, if you had a DNA match for one of your eight second great-grandparent couples, that's pretty significant because it's a very small number of couples out of a very, very large population. As you go back, of course, we see this thing double every generation until you get to what I've been talking about, 128 couples at the sixth great-grandparent level. So the odds of actually finding a match get better and better the further you go back, except that we all don't inherit the same DNA from the same ancestors. And some ancestors, we don't get any DNA at all, right? Exactly. So the question is, how significant is this DNA match that I found in confirming the paper research that I've done? 
Well, I think the key in this is that you are incorporating this DNA match as part of your traditional genealogical research, that it's you're using it to confirm information that you've been able to ascertain through your own traditional research. It's important that as we're evaluating some of these more distant cousins and some of these more distant matches, that we need to evaluate their entire family trees for other possible origins of that shared DNA. Another element that you mentioned briefly is that eventually there will be a point in our own family trees where we will not have inherited significant amounts of DNA from many of our own ancestors. Right. Um, we kind of call it the difference between genetic trees versus genealogical trees. And at the point around seven to eight generations is where your ancestors begin to fall off of your genetic tree. Around 10 generations, you're only going to inherit significant portions of your DNA from about half of your ancestors. So it's important as you're evaluating some of these more distant matches that you also make sure that you have genetic matches for the intervening generation. I guess the idea is what you're saying is it helps to prove that there is some DNA flowing from that far back, right? Because we don't obtain DNA from everybody. Yeah, and DNA is not going to skip generations. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good point. So it's amazing, though, when you crunch the numbers on this, I mean, what the population of our country was back in the day, like in 1650, we had all of 50,000 people here. That's about the population of today's Northern Marianas Islands. In yeah. 1740, we had what is today the population of Delaware. And in 1770, just before the revolution, 2.1 million, which is today's population of New Mexico. So, you know, really small populations, but they're spread out. So we're not even dealing with populations that large. And then, of course, many of the people in the population at that time were children or single individuals, or even uh, couples that didn't have children, right? Exactly. And so because of that, we really want to make sure that we analyze all of the entire tree for each match to make sure that they don't have other lines of their ancestry from the same small pockets of populations so that we can lend greater credence to the fact that this common ancestral couple that we have identified for this distant cousin is most likely the common source of that shared DNA. Right. Only in the most recent generations, going back to, say, second, maybe third great grandparents, are those DNA matches exceptionally significant. Yes? Yes. When you go back beyond that, then it gets more and more challenging to really place significance on it. Yeah, and part of the, the challenge of that is that with the closer generations, we have distinct levels of DNA sharing that we expect yes. for different levels of relationship. But once you get back to the level of fourth cousin to fifth cousin, sixth, seventh, eighth cousin, you know, an eighth cousin may have um, exactly the same chance of sharing any given amount of DNA as a fourth cousin. And so it's a little bit harder to say, yes, this is the common ancestral ancestral couple that that gave us this DNA. Yeah, it's fascinating to try to put this all together and figure out, okay, here's a person who shares some DNA with me to some level, and we share this ancestor on this chart, but is that really important? Great insight as always, and always great to have you on the show. And let me add before we go that these genetic cousins that are more distant can be significant for your research, but it may be necessary to identify additional cousins that are also shared in common, that also have the same segments of DNA that you share in common. And if you don't have those, then it could be a good idea to begin searching out additional descendants of that ancestral couple to see how they fit into the known network of genetic cousins that you've already established. He's DNA analyst Paul Woodbury from LegacyTree.com. Thanks. Great advice, Paul. Thank you. You gotta love the science of family history these these days. Love that DNA. All right, coming up for you next, of course, preservation with Tom Perry from tmcplace.com. He's our preservation authority. And we're going to talk about the importance of knowing who your end users are going to be when you decide how you want to digitize your materials. It's going to save you a lot of money. So listen up. It's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Extreme
Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA-certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. When someone asks what is forever.com, I tell them it's a new kind of digital storage, like for your photos and documents and all the family memories. And they always shoot back with, well, that's not a very new thing. There's Facebook Shutterfly Flickr. Then I say, oh, but on forever, you own all your content. There's no third party ads and it's guaranteed for your lifetime plus 100 years. Do the others do that? Okay, so like I said, forever.com, a new kind of digital storage. You are the chief memory officer of your family. You get that frantic phone call about the reunion in two days and they need the slideshow. And you're ready because you use forever.com. Photos, news clippings, heck, you automatically upload the photos on your cell phone every day. You have everything digitally stored and organized where you can share it privately with your friends and family. No ads and it's permanent. Guaranteed for generations. Yes, you are the chief memory officer and you have forever.com. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. It's Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, the radio root sleuth, and it is preservation time. Tom Perry, our preservation authority, is in the house. And, Tom, we were just talking uh, off the air here a few moments ago about people who come into your store and they don't really know the end game of what they're trying to do in terms of digitizing. And I'm sure this happens in places all over the country. And they wind up buying a Cadillac when really all they need is a Mini Cooper. Oh, that is so true. I mean, it's like buying a car. A lot of times when you go to buy a car, they say how much you have to spend, not what are your needs. And we're just the opposite of that. We want to find out, you know, what somebody's needs are. And whether you send stuff to us, bring it into us, or use one of your local players, you need to, you know, be careful because some people will charge you as much as they can get away with. And there's a lot of real good, honest people out there that will do what's right. But you want to make sure what, like you use the word end game is going to be. And that's a perfect word. What do you ultimately want to do with all your slides, your photos, your old real, real audio, your film, video, all these kind of things? What do you want to do with them? Let me give you an example. We had a gentleman come in the other day that had, oh, probably about two or three dozen VHS tapes, and he wanted them all on Blu-ray. Blu-ray is a little bit more expensive to do than DVD and MP4s. And so we tried talking him out of it, say, hey, you know, we're happy to do Blu-rays for you if that's what you want. However... You know, DVDs are going to be just as good because when you're working with something that's already electronic, like a videotape or an audio tape, whether you go to Blu-ray, whether you go to MP4s, whether you go to DVD, whatever, it's not going to change your content. The only reason you go to a Blu-ray is because you want to go to a Blu-ray. There's no reason for it. If you go with DVD, 
you accomplish several things. It's going to cost you less. They're going to be done faster. They're going to be more compatible with friends and neighbors and, you know, relatives that you're going to send them off to. And you're not gaining anything at all. And some people say, oh, well, yeah, Blu-rays have the ability to play better. That's true. However, if you have a Blu-ray player and you play a DVD in it, most Blu-ray players will up-convert your videos anyway. So if you have, whether it's an old Disney DVD, whether it's a VHS you've turned into a DVD, if you play it in a Blu-ray player, it's going to actually look better than if you played it in your old DVD player just by, you know, the up-conversion that it does for you naturally. So, I mean, if somebody says, no, I want Blu-ray, period, that's fine. However, we want to educate people and let them know you might not need Blu-ray. So if your only interest is, is to get your VHS or whatever, I'm sure you use VHS as a generic term almost, to get your items preserved, if you're just going to want to email them to people, you're not going to want to make a whole bunch of copies, then I'd suggest you go to MP3s or MP4s because they're small enough, but they're really good quality that you can actually post them on your Facebook page. You can put them in Dropbox or whatever kind of cloud device you want to use and give people the link to it. You can actually email them. They're small enough. And so then they have the access to them immediately. They don't have to wait for the disc. Some people, you know, want to actually have a physical disc, and that's fine. A lot of the, you know, older generation, they want to have that physical disc. They don't understand what I download this to, you know, my thumb drive, and I plug my thumb drive into my TV. They don't understand that. But if everybody in your family understands technology, just go with MP3s or MP4s. And it's always nice to have a backup as a CD or a DVD, because as we say on almost every show, we always recommend you have everything, all your memories backed up on a disc, whether it's DVD or CD or an M-Disc or Blu-ray. You have it on your hard drive and then in one or two clouds, whether you use Google Cloud, whether you use Lightjar, whether you use Dropbox, it doesn't matter. You want to get it up in at least one cloud and possibly two. And if you don't have a ton of stuff, you can usually get their free ones. It's good you know, for so many, like maybe a terabyte or such. And if you have a whole bunch, it's not that much more expensive. I mean, we use tons and tons of that. And, you know, we pay $100 a month for, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff. And after the break, we'll go in and talk a little bit more about how you can best determine what you need. All right. Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that 
meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA-certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. And we are back. Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, the Radio Root Sleuth. We're doing preservation here with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. And Tom, we've just been talking about the challenge of knowing the end use of what you're doing as you digitize and how to save money and, and how to get the most bang for your buck with what you're trying to do. How do people determine what their end use is? The best thing is to listen to our shows, and especially since they're searchable now with the PDFs, you can go in and type in a topic and possibly find one of our episodes where we've addressed something. Another way to do it is even if you want to stay local, that's fine. We're here to help you in any way we can. Just send your questions to ask Tom at tmcplace.com and say, this is what I have. This is what my end use is. What should I do? And we'll let you know. And if you want to take it to a local place, you know, that's great. We actually want people to support their local people. But if you want to send it to us, we're happy to work with you as well. So basically, let's talk about what we call boxes, whether you're talking about MP3s, MP4s, DVDs, CDs, Blu-ray, M-Disc, Blu-ray, M-Disc, all these different things. Look at them as different size of luggage or boxes because they all pretty much can do the same thing. For instance, a thumb drive doesn't care what kind of data you put on it. Right. You can put audio, you can put video, you can put, you know, actually video games, whatever you want to put on it. But So you need to understand what you want. The majority of the time when you want audio, like old reel-to-reel tapes or cassette tapes or dictaphone or whatever you have, we usually transfer those to CD and MP3s because the CDs, you have that physical thing you can save and put away. You've got your MP3s, you can put on your iPhone, your Android, whatever you want. If you have video, then we suggest MP4 and DVD. So again, you've got the physical disc to hold, right. but then you also have an MP4 that's on a flash drive. You can email them. You can distribute them any way you want real easy. Then the next step up, you're looking at which we've mentioned, DVDs and CDs. You can put audio on a DVD. You can put video on a CD. You're just limited with the size of the box. So most people, when they say DVD, they're thinking video. When you're saying CD, you're thinking audio. Yes. So when we're doing slides and photos, we usually do those as JPEGs or TIFFs. And so we can put them on a CD, we can put them on a thumb drive, we can put them on a DVD. And the only thing that determines what we put on them is how much stuff you have. Sure. You know, like if you've got a 2,000 square foot house, you know, a 100 square foot carpet isn't going to fill your house. If you have a 200 square foot house, a 1,000 feet of carpet is overkill. You need to know what you need. You will need a DVD with four pictures on it. Because the problem is you're not filling the whole disc and say, well, so what? They're not that much more expensive. However, if somebody you're going with only has access to a CD reader, they're not going to be able to play your DVD. So you want to check on that. And then Blu-rays are awesome. They're a a good way to storage stuff. You can get almost twice as much on a DVD. Plus, there's several sizes of Blu-rays. You can get, you know, ones that are two and a half terabytes. You can get all different sizes. So you figure out what my needs are. Don't buy the dump truck if all you need is a, you know, Ram pickup. So not to confuse people, though, when you talked earlier about if you don't need a Blu-ray, don't pay $5 extra for it. That's because it's a different purpose. Exactly. The only time you absolutely positively want to go with Blu-ray is if you're using something optical. Like we talked earlier about magnetic with VHS tapes. It's no difference. If it's magnetic, DVD 9 out of 10 times is going to be fine for you. And then they also have Blu-ray M-Discs now. I still think that's the best way to describe all these storage devices, Tom, like little boxes or big boxes. Thanks so much for coming on. Good you have been here. I cannot believe we are done for another week. Thanks once again to Mary Tedesco from the PBS series Genealogy Roadshow. They're back for a third season right now. You can catch it Tuesday nights. Check your local listings for times. And by the way, if you wanted to catch some of the things Mary had to say about Italian research... Make sure you check out the podcast through iTunes and iHeartRadio and ExtremeGenes.com. 
Thanks also to Paul Woodbury, the DNA expert from LegacyTree.com, for coming on and talking about the significance of DNA matches for ancestors further back than 200 years. You'll love to hear what he has to say. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 